Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I would like to present the 12th part of my seemingly inexhaustible lectures on the gross pathology of cattle. And part 12 is going to cover the respiratory system. Before I do that, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who have provided me images over the years through direct contact and through image collections, which allow me to put these lectures together. Let's start with a very important disease of the respiratory tract of cattle. In this particular case, we can see there is a marked rhinitis with congestion of the nasal mucosa and a extensive fibrinonecrotic or diphtheritic membrane. And this is a disease that's caused by bovine herpes virus type 1 and is known as infectious bovine rhinotracheitis very commonly seen in feedlot calves, if not before, most calves get it within three weeks of getting to the feedlot. The nose and nasal mucosa here are extremely hyperemic, which is characteristic of this particular condition and the, its colloquial name of red nose. Bovine herpes type 1 is a very classic alpha herpes virus whose characteristic lesion is necrosis with formation of syncytial cells and intranuclear inclusions. We'll see them more prominently as we get into the larynx, but you can see them in the respiratory mucosa as well. Parainfluenza is a virus which mimics its clinical syndrome but is never quite severe. And you can also see erosions and occasional ulcers within the nasal mucosa. But once again, it's not as severe as the destruction that you're going to see with bovine herpes virus type 1. Let's not forget that bovine herpes virus type 1 is not the most particular virus. It may cause ulcerative and necrotizing lesions in other parts of the body, including the oral mucosa, all the way down through the abomasum where the epithelium changes from a stratified squamous to a glandular and the virus stops there. You can also see it uh, cause infections in and around the genitals mimicking infectious pustular vulvovaginitis typically caused by bovine herpes virus type 3 but from which bovine herpes type herpes virus type 1 can occasionally be cultured. Here's a chronic ulcer of the uh, uh, nasal cavity. It's well encapsulated. It's filled with purulent mucosa, uh, purulent material, and I will bet you a dollar to a donut that if you stick a culturette in there, what you're going to get back is Truparella pyogenes. It may not be the cause of this lesion, this is an area where you may get abscesses from other agents, especially Fusobacterium necrophorum, a common commensal of the upper nasal cavity of cattle. But Tuparella is well known for going in and kicking out other uh, uh, bacteria and being the sole survivor in this microaerophilic environment that you find in an abscess. Here's a rather old picture of a lesion that is still around today. For your orientation, we are looking at the anterior part of the nasal vestibule. Here is the hard palate down here, and you can see these multiple polypoid growths within the nasal mucosa. I would have a differential diagnosis for something like that. The first one would be a chronic form of allergic rhinitis, which is occasionally seen in Jersey cattle. Some people call it atopic rhinitis. And what you see are these plaques of hyperplastic epithelium with squamous metaplasia. And underneath you'll see sort of a vascular proliferation with fibroplasia and an eosinophilic infiltrate. The condition is thought to be due to an immediate or type 1 hypersensitivity to plant pollens or fungal spores, which are ubiquitous in the animal's environment, especially in colder months where the animals are probably living in barns. Uh, another possibility 
is something that usually forms a much larger polypoid growth known as a mycotic nasal granuloma, also generally having eosinophilic uh, accumulation and can look to the point where they look sort of yellow-green on cut section. On section, you will see a large number of macrophages surrounding fungal hyphae and various chlamydospores. And most of these fungi are, are usually plant saprophytes. Occasionally, you might come into contact with some of the dermatiaceous or pigmented fungi, such as Dreschlera and Bipolaris. These granulomas tend to be farther up in the nasal vestibule in this location, but are often much larger mass that might get to the point that they are occlusal in nature for one of the nostrils. The next image is a nasal polyp. Now, occasionally we'll see these in cattle as we see them occasionally in horses, and we often see them in cats. And this is a nonspecific finding often due to chronic rhinitis or sinusitis. Here's an absolutely great picture by Kim Newkirk from the University of Tennessee. And we see a bilaterally symmetric lesion within the larynx. These lesions, which are covered by a fibronecrotic membrane, are typically located over the vocal processes as the medial angles of the retinoid cartilage and is thought to arise from coughing. Commonly seen in feedlot animals because when you get calves mixed together in large groups from, from various locations, they often share various viruses and bacteria and are exposed to them for the first time and the development of bo the bovine respiratory disease complex is very prevalent. We're going to talk about the various viruses and bacteria that, that make up the bovine respiratory disease complex throughout the rest of this lecture. But this particular lesion is associated with infection by one or two agents. Once you get the, uh, the coughing and the rubbing together of these cartilages, John King used to say that uh, they would cry at night because they were separated from their mothers and the constant bawling would cause this lesion. I'm not sure about that, but I'm pretty sure about, uh, about coughing, resulting in friction in this area of the larynx, and you get an opening in the mucosa which allows a, a very common commensal, Fusobacterium necrophorum, which we've talked about many times before, um, to invade and cause necrotic lesions here. Another very common uh, inhabitant of this lesion. The second differential, I always put the two together, Fusobacterium necrophorum and Histophilus somni. This is a fairly mild, incipient lesion, but it can get extremely bad like this with extensive lesions which result in partial occlusion of the larynx. Uh, the animals will become dyspneic, they will salivate, and uh, really have a lot of trouble. The name of the condition is necrotic laryngitis, which is a very good descriptor of what's going on here histologically. Here's a case of laryngeal edema, a nonspecific finding that can be the result of a number of injuries, including uh, hypersensitivity, with urticaria uh, formation as in a type 1 hypersensitive reaction, serum sickness, or infectious agents like blackleg. I think you would also have to put the uh, inhalation of irritants such as silo gases as well as hyperthermia on your list of differentials for laryngeal edema. We move down a little farther from the nasal cavity, but here is a trachea that is extremely hyperemic and has multifocal coalescing diphtheritic or, or fibrinonecrotic membranes, and this is our friend bovine herpes virus again in one of its very typical locations. In addition to causing a lot of damage in the lining of the airways, which is a preferred site for replication of this virus, 
it also is one of the first members to think about when talking about the bovine respiratory disease complex. And it primes the animal for a secondary and severe bacterial pneumonia. Here's a picture that I really like. And this is a cross-section of the trachea. And there's diffuse severe tracheal edema. But there's also a large hemorrhagic cast or clot within the lumen of the trachea. This particular condition is usually seen in the summer in hot temperatures is referred to as the tracheal edema and hemorrhage syndrome of feedlot cattle also known as the honker syndrome. Honking refers to the characteristic loud inspiratory noise made by these animals and it may cause death by asphyxiation as you can imagine from this picture in feedlot cattle. The cause of this isn't known but it is seen most often in hot weather and the animals that have it often have concurrent bronchopneumonia suggesting that rapid breathing or hyperpnea with negative intratracheal pressures during inspiration may cause mechanical injury to the lining of the trachea, edema, and hemorrhage. With a lesion like this, the chance of the animal surviving isn't good, but it's a lot worse if you force them to move. Lesions most often seen in the caudal third of the trachea, and there often is no appreciable lesion in the lung. Well, what do you do with a, a, a calf who has this problem? You can do a tracheostomy. You can provide shade and cooling with water and try and bring temperature down, and then the animal should be sent to slaughter as soon as possible because the chance of relapse is very, very high. Here's a non-lesion in a pretty picture by Dr. Donald O'Toole, and we're looking at uh, focally extensive areas of parenchymal pigmentation, not only in the lung, but also in the liver. It's not elevated, it's flat, so this would be melanosis. Pigment in itself really doesn't uh, take up any volume, so they're flat lesions. Melanoma, which would be uncommon in cattle, would generally be raised lesions. So this is just melanosis. And you can see melanosis uh, very commonly in production animals, especially ruminants. You'll see it all over the body in just about any organ. And it's not anything to get very concerned about. Here's a congenital lesion of the lungs, which is seen in calves in a great picture by Paul Stromberg. And if we take a look and compare the lungs, which don't have the normal outline, they're certainly atelectatic. So we know that this was probably a stillborn calf. And when you compare the lungs to the diameter of the normal trachea, you can realize that these lungs are hypoplastic. This is a complex lesion resulting from a number of factors, one of which is compression of the lungs. The lungs aren't able to expand. They will not grow to their full size. And this may be associated with anything from diaphragmatic hernias, which compress the lungs, with hydrops, uh, fetalis, uh, anasarca in dexter bulldogs, pleural effusions, anything that compresses the lungs will do this. If you take a look histologically, the airways develop normally, but the, uh, the alveoli don't. And people have thought that development is also linked to the presence of uh, a surfactant, which is secreted by pulmonary epithelium and fills the air spaces. And it is required for the final development of the alveoli within the lungs. As we've said many times, if you see a defect like this, look for other defects because birth defects uh, generally happen in groups rather than singly. Okay, let's start talking about 
the numbers of viruses and bacteria referred to collectively as the vo bovine respiratory disease complex that you will see very often in feedlot cattle but can happen spontaneously. The days of being able to culture one virus or one bacterium from animals with pneumonia are probably behind us. In many cases of pneumonia that we see are multiple viruses and bacteria which work closely together to cause severe disease in cattle. Here's a calf which is having severe problems, open mouth breathing and drooling as a result of infection by bovine respiratory syncytial virus, a morbilli virus that causes lesions very similar to those which are seen in, in dogs with distemper or other forms of morbilli viral pneumonia. The virus is easily spread by aerosols, with overcrowding being a major factor in its spread, and it replicates in the epithelial cells lining the airways, including the nasal cavity, trachea, and bronchi and bronchioli. And it also can infect type 2 pneumocytes and alveolar macrophages. So that's just about every cell type in the lung. Initial histologic effects will be loss of cilia with necrosis of bronchial and bronchial epithelial cells, which results in plugging of the airways and marked dyspnea with collapse of underinflated alveoli. It also has the ability to affect alveolar macrophages, decreasing their ability to opsonize and phagocytize other pathogens, leaving the door open for bacterial invaders. The presence of one or two animals who are having this type of difficulty breathing, in addition to a fever, coughing, discharge from the nose and the eyes, and tachypnea, should highlight the, the suspicion that subclinical infection is also widespread in this herd. One of the very interesting features of bovine respiratory syncytial virus uh, on gross examination of the lungs is sort of a biphasic nature to the appearance of the lung. The cranial ventral lungs are often collapsed and leathery due to extensive necrosis of the airway epithelium, plugging of the airways, and collapse of the alveoli. However, because it is a interstitial pneumonia, the entire lung is affected and the caudal parts of the lung often look hyperinflated due to the tremendous pressures which are going through those large airways in the back. The largest parts of the airways and the lungs, generally in the caudal dorsal lobes, they're much di more difficult to plug up, and so they will take the brunt of that great inspiratory effort which is seen in these animals. There is also extensive edema which you can see in this particular lung, and areas of emphysema, a nonspecific finding in dyspneic cattle. Remember histologically to look in the lung for not only the changes we've mentioned, but also the presence of multinucleated syncytial giant cells with multiple nuclei and with prominent intranuclear viral inclusions and cytoplasmic inclusions of viral proteins. Here is one more very similar image of BRSV where we have collapse and atelectasis, a very hard, firm, leathery feel to the craniovental lobes of the lung with hyperinflation, edema, and emphysema of caudal lobes. A virus that very closely resembles BRSV in almost all of its forms, both gross and histologically down to the presence of multinucleated syncytial cells 
is bovine parainfluenza type 3, which is in the same family, the paramyxoviridae family, in another genus of the respiroviruses. Usually, the symptoms and clinical disease are much more mild, but the virus also likes ciliated epithelium, the epithelium of the airways, which gives rise to the lobular pattern that we see here because within all of these lobules, in the center of that, you're going to have a blocked airway, which has resulted in collapse of the surrounding alveoli. Notice you don't see the severe edema, the uh, emphysema, and the caudal dorsal lobes, although they are still hyperinflated, and we can even see rib patterns here. They also have epithelial syncytia with intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies, but you don't see them in the frequency that you see with bovine respiratory syncytial virus. You may see one or two in an entire section of lung. Clinical disease is much less common than in outbreaks of BRSV. And the most important role of parainfluenza 3 is to serve as that gatekeeper or initiator for more severe bacterial infections to come. Well, I should plunge right into the bacterial infections associated with bovine respiratory disease complex. There's plenty of time for those. I wanted to show this particular picture to let you know that uh, not every case of a fibrinous pleuritis is shipping fever. This is from a young calf, which has not only a fibrinous pleuritis, but also has a fibrinous pericarditis and epicarditis. And whenever you see fibrin within the epicardial sac, I want you to think about sepsis. This is a case of E. coli sepsis, or septicemia, in calves, which we can see as a result of navel ill as we talked about, or joint ill as we talked about in previous lectures, and the development of gram-negative septicemic conditions. So a little bit of fibrin or a lot of fibrin doesn't necessarily mean that we're dealing with a shipping fever or the bovine respiratory disease complex. It also depends often on the age of the animal. Okay, let's get into it. Shipping fever. We've known about shipping fever uh, ever since we went to our first year of veterinary school. Shipping fever is often associated with, with transport, with congregation, overcrowding. But now, over the last 20 or 30 years, we realize that it is a very complex combination of one or more viruses and bacteria. 25 years ago when I started as a resident, um, shipping fever was pretty much attributed to Pasteurella hemolytica, and that was the only agent associated with it. Well, over the years, I've added five more bacterial agents, and then the two viruses that we've already talked about, and probably a couple of other very minor viral components. but. But now my differential diagnosis for quote-unquote shipping fever in cattle for a fibrinosuppurative pleural pneumonia has risen to six different agents. Three of them come from the family of the Pasteurellaceae. Pasteurella hemolytica has been renamed Mannheimia hemolytica. Pasteurella multocida is number two in no particular order and has maintained the Pasteurella name. Biebersteinia triolosi used to be Pasteurella triolosi and would be a third cause of shipping fever. Two other causes of shipping fever which have almost identical gross and histologic appearances, as all of these bacteria do, go in the family of the mycoplasmas, 
One is Mycoplasma mycoides, small species, a, a disease that has been eradicated from the U.S., but is still present in other parts of the world. And then a disease which is still emerging, has spread through from Canada down into the U.S., is Mycoplasma bovis. My sixth agent which causes shipping fever is Histophilus somni. Feedlot diseases associated with Histophilus somni have changed pretty radically over the last 30 or 40 years, whereas back in the 60s and the early 70s, the encephalitic form known as thromboembolic meningitis, um, now thrombotic encephalopathy, uh, was one of the predominant forms. In today's feedlot, that has changed so that pneumonia and myocarditis are the prevalent forms associated with histophilus today. Now, it's difficult to diagnose and differentiate between these on a gross basis and sometimes on a histologic basis. The lesions associated with many of them histologically are large areas of necrosis, infarction, degeneration of epithelial cells that mix with neutrophil debris known as uh, oat cells, and extensive interlobular edema and emphysema. We're going to look at some of these agents, and there are a few things that may set them apart. But I think that uh, culture or other identification methods are generally required to see which one you're dealing with, or maybe you're dealing with multiple. Here's an absolutely gorgeous picture by Giselle Sino of Kansas State University, which shows a nice chunk of lung. One of the characteristics of Mannheimia and any of the pasturellas, because they are gram-negative organisms, is endotoxemia and local damage to the vasculature, resulting in an outpouring of fibrin into the alveoli and into the interlobular septa. I'm not much on the old time terms, red hepatization and gray hepatization, but you can see them both in this particular image with the gray hepatization probably relating to the amount of fibrin within the tissue. Manheimia is a commonly isolated bacteria in the upper respiratory tract and lymph nodes of cattle and can cause sepsis or a life-threatening pleural pneumonia in affected animals. The damage that it does is a result of not only the endotoxin that it produces, but the leukotoxins or RTX exotoxins that affect ruminant leukocytes, causing them to explode, to cause tremendous damage within these alveoli. And the damage that the endotoxin does to the local vasculature will take out even larger areas of lung as a result of coagulation necrosis, ischemia, and infarction. Infarcted areas of the lung may be retained almost intact for a long period of time, which are referred to as sequestra. Here's another great picture from Nick Sorensen when he was at Oklahoma State University showing the classic marbling uh, of these inflamed and necrotic areas of the lung, the edema, and the marked expansion of the interlobular septa by fibrin. Just one more picture of shipping fever due to Mannheimia hemolytica by Amanda Cruz. A nice picture which shows these sequestra, these dead necrotic infarcted areas of the lung, as well as the extensive fibrin and this greenish edema which is a result of vascular damage by Mannheimia's very potent endotoxin. 
Another common cause of quote-unquote shipping fever or component is Histophilus somni. We talked about how pneumonia is starting to be the most common form that is seen in feedlots today. Histophilus often does not have the tremendous outpouring of fibrin, although it can cause vasculitis, but you tend to have more of an atelectasis and pneumonia within the craniovental lobes. There is often extensive exudate within the airways of these lungs. And just a slightly higher view, showing a really nice demarcation between the atelectatic inflamed lungs and the remaining normal lungs. Have you ever wondered how much lung you can have before you start dying? Well, after a loss of about 30% of your lung, your oxygen content in your blood will start to decrease. So it's really not all that much. 30% in some of these you know, animals is far less than we're seeing on these images. Something that looks fairly similar to that, well demarcated areas of cranioventral uh, collapse, is what we see with Pasteurella multocida. One of the sore cool things about Pasteurella multocida, at least as relayed to me by Dr. Donald O'Toole, who is just a fantastic pathologist, is that on the cut surface of these lungs, even in the absence of overlying fibrin, you often will see exudate just run out. And histologically, and this is borne up as I've seen cases of this, Pasteurella multocida is the agent which does not do extensive damage to the lining epithelium of these small airways. When you take a section, you'll see exudate within the lumen, but often the airway epithelium is intact. In most of the other ones, it's pretty well destroyed. This picture from the University of Milan, Dr. Mario Cagnotti, looks a lot like some of the earlier pictures I showed you of Mannheimia hemolytica. It was a second agent that I added to the list for shipping fever because the two grossly and histologically are almost identical. The big difference is that this is contagious bovine pleuropneumonia, a disease caused by mycoplasma mycoides, mycoides, small colony type. But for all intents and purposes, it looks exactly like Mannheimia histolytica pneumonia, which is interesting because mycoplasma is a cell wall deficient bacteria that lives within the airways, has no apparent toxins or pathogenic factors, but, but can cause a lesion with the vascular damage, the infarction, the oat cell, which is identical to, uh, to Mannheimia hemolytica. This particular agent back in the early 1900s was the result or was the cause of the formation of the Bureau of Animal Industry. Nowadays, the descendant is probably the USDA, but the BAI was put together simply to combat this particular disease. We did an excellent job with it. We eradicated it in the early 1950s and the BAI sort of went away. There are a couple of unique things to, uh, uh, to mycoplasma mycoides. Uh, unfortunately, it's not in the country. I have no personal experience with it. The lesions are usually unilateral or often unilateral. And uh, the middle lobe is usually the most severely affected. And the caudal lobes are more consistently affected with mycoplasma mycoides than with the other bacterial pneumonias that we've talked about. But all of the other things look very much like a great case of manheimiosis. Another condition which will cause 
quote-unquote shipping fever, and I've added to my list a number of years ago, is mycoplasma bovis, a condition that will cause a generalized septicemia. You can see it in the uh, middle ear. You can see it in the joints. You can see it in the mammary gland. And in the lungs, to me, causes a somewhat characteristic lesion. Because myco this particular type of mycoplasma really wants to live in the airways. It has a very stereotypic response when it gets into the lung, resulting in infection and distribution throughout the cilia, ciliostasis, uh, loss of the mucociliary escalator, influx of tremendous numbers of neutrophils, which result in damage to the lining of the airways, loss of elastin, and fairly profound bronchiectasis. This is the one in all of them I think causes the best bronchiectasis. It is not just bronchiectasis of the craniovitreal lung. You can also see it throughout the lung. And then because uh, mycoplasmas generally have a superantigen, there will be pretty profound uh, hyperplasia of BALT and infiltration of lymphocyte and plasma cells around affected airways. To me, a section cut through an affected area of the lung with mycoplasma bovis looks like a bunch of golf balls or ping pong balls that are embedded in the lung. Another picture by Jose Ramos Vera showing this sort of golf ball appearance to the lung. And on cut section, this is what you get. Just tremendous bronchiectasis in cases of mycoplasma bovis. Here's a fabulous picture. Let's leave shipping fever now. I think we've covered that pretty well. One of those things that you have to have a differential diagnosis. It's nice to play the game where you think that you can pick one from the other, but probably in truth you can't. So make sure that you have additional te techniques available to confirm your gross diagnosis. Okay. Here's a great picture of a lung that's been sectioned, has tremendous amounts of this yellowish, thick exudate scatter throughout the entire lung. And whenever I see yellowish, sort of caseous inflammation, one of the first things I'm going to think about is tuberculosis or Mycobacterium bovis in cattle. It has a very characteristic yellowish green exudate. Now, I don't want you to think that this is a common lesion in cattle. The, ma the vast majority of reactors for tuberculosis, who'll be positive on tuberculin tests, are going to have no lesions at all. Every once in a while, you're going to see one with one lymph node that is enlarged and contains this type of inflammation. Now, if that particular lymph node ruptures, especially into a blood vessel, that's when you start to get these lesions. I would bet this animal had a hyalur lymph node that was uh, filled with this type of exudate, which ruptured and it went down into the lungs. But at that point, you can see the granulomas anywhere. It's a pretty rare occurrence. You could see them in the liver, in the meninges, in a joint, wherever. But that means that you've had one lymph node which is ruptured into the vasculature. Once it gets in there, it can go anywhere it wants. I just want you to think about when you see this yellowish orange inflammation, I want you to think about uh, of Mycobacterium bovis. Now you're going to take a section, you're going to put some acid fast stains on it, and you're going to look for hours for one or two little bacilli. It could be extremely frustrating. When we deal with tuberculosis, Mycobacterium tuberculosis in, in humans and non-human primates, Mycobacterium bovis in cattle, these lesions are paucicellular, very prominent Th1 response, very effective at getting rid of a lot of the bacilli. Never get rid of them all, but they make it very difficult to find these histologically, even with good acid fast stains. I tend to use both a Zeal Nielsen and a Fight for Occo, and you can still look for hours. And you know it's there. 
you can have a positive PCR result and it still takes a long time to find the bacilli. Uh, Mycobacterium avium, all the various species involved in that complex, is a different type of response. It's a Th2 response and there are lots and lots of bacilli and when you put on one of those acid fast things, it totally lights up your slide. Another really great picture of hemorrhage and thrombosis of a large pulmonary artery. Some people call this caudal vena cava thrombosis syndrome. This is a fairly long-term sequela of ruminal acidosis. When you have acidosis due to carbohydrate overload, you have ulceration within the rumen, primarily in the ventral sacs. You have absorption of bacteria, which could be a wide range of bacteria, but one that's always in the mix is Fusobacterium. So don't sleep on that. Okay. When the vessels of the four stomachs are ulcerated, bacteria get access into the portal venous system, and they go on this highway straight to the liver. And you start to develop liver abscesses, and it very well may stop there. The body may encapsulate them, keep them there. But oftentimes, they break through and they continue to move forward, resulting in thrombosis of the caudal vena cava, and little bits of the septic thrombi will break off, will pass through the right heart into the lungs where they can cause thrombosis of a large pulmonary vessel, resulting in life-threatening hemorrhage. They will eventually erode through the wall of this vessel, cause hemorrhage into the surrounding uh, lung tissue, and a lot of this hemorrhage will be coughed up, come up through the trachea, out through the nose, and the animal in the midst of dying will paint the walls of its stanchion. There are a number of other lesions that you may see in these lungs, including pulmonary embolisms, vegetative valvular endocarditis or fibrinosuppurative valvulitis of the right heart as well. Here's a very nice pulmonary thrombus, which was not the result of ruminal acidosis, but was instead uh, secondary to a case of gangrenous staphylococcus mastitis. In this great picture by Dr. Uh, Jose Ramos Vera. And in addition to this, you can see this animal was dyspneic before death. That's what happens when you have pulmonary thrombosis. And you can see the tremendous amount of emphysema within the interlobular septa, which is a sequela to dyspnea and greatly elevated interthoracic pressure as this animal becomes hypoxemic and compens compensatorily starts to breathe very hard. Just another uh, wonderful close-up of this fantastic lesion. Here's a combination of interlobular emphysema and tremendous edema, not only within the interlobular septa, but also within the alveoli as well. This condition has gone through a number of names, including acute bovine pulmonary emphysema and edema to now it's called atypical interstitial pneumonia as opposed to typical interstitial pneumonia which I've never heard of but atypical interstitial pneumonia. This is a form of acute pulmonary toxicosis which results by a number of pneumotoxins. We tend to think of the liver as the primary and it is the primary detoxifier of the body. But there are similar cells which contain cytochrome oxidases at the entrance of the uh, smaller airways, okay, known as club cells. Club cells have these cytochrome oxidases and a number of toxins that are inhaled are detoxified by this particular uh, group of cells. 
However, if that isn't effective, you can get causes of atypical interstitial pneumonia, where the toxin actually gets into the alveoli and will do damage either to the type 1 pneumocytes or the septal endothelium, or both, resulting in a tremendous outpouring of fluid from the injured alveolar wall, and that fluid is protein-rich, so it will polymerize within the alveolus, resulting in the formation of hyaline membranes, a thick layer of fibrin around the alveolar wall, which prevents any type of oxygen exchange. On top of that, damaged vessels will pour fluid and edema, which gets into the interlobular space. These animals don't do very well. They don't really respond to anything. Before I forget, I better name these toxins, which you've heard about since veterinary school. But uh, one is L-tryptophan, which is seen when the animals are turned out onto lush green pasture, much at the beginning of spring, or they're turned out to a new field, and they're not used to this level of lush pasture, and they're unable to detoxify the L-tryptophan. Moldy sweet potatoes um, will be infected by a mold known as Fusarium solani, and one of the toxins that it produces when metabolized by the cells in the lungs forms a very potent pneumotoxin called 4-ipomeanol. You can also see it with plants such as stinkwood or perilla mint, rapeseed, and even large pastures of kale can cause this particular lesion. Usually you see it from uh, 2 to 10 days after the animal moves from dry to lush tryptophan. It's not an immediate thing. It takes a couple of days to, uh, to take effect. But uh, morbidity is up to 50% in affected herds, and, and mortality often reaches up to 100%. I should mention that uh, L-tryptophan in itself is not toxic. It has to be converted in the rumen by ruminal bacteria to 3-methylindol. Three 3-methylindol three goes through the bloodstream to the lung and is transformed by those club cells by the cytochrome P450 enzymes of the club cells to a toxic principle known as 3-methylindolinine. And this causes damages to the type 1 pneumocytes and the endothelial cells of the lung. Just another great picture of the emphysema and edema associated with atypical interstitial pneumonia. Another picture that uh, if you call this uh, atypical interstitial pneumonia, I'd have absolutely no problem with that. This is a, a, uh, a different condition which mimics that called allergic pneumonitis. usually affects multiple animals which are reared in confinement, and it res results from the chronic inhalation of various bacteria and fungi, including Micropolysporum faini, which has been renamed for those who play that game to Saccharopolyspora rectivigula in hay. And these are type 3 reactions in which the agent directly activates complement by the alternative pathway. And although the, the morphology suggests a delayed type 4 hypersensitivity, it's really a, a type 3 hypersensitivity. If we got very close, you'd see little tiny gray foci with lymphoplasmacytic and sometimes granulomatous infiltrates throughout the lung around the airways. So this is allergic pneumonitis. Ah, getting away from the toxic principles. Here's a large hydatid cyst in the lung of an ox. Remember hydatid cysts? are the larval form uh, of echinococcus granulosus, which is a cestode whose definitive host is the dog. The dog passes the, uh, the tapeworms in its feces, and then the tapeworms will 
lay in the grass until a suitable intermediate host, which can be just about anything, uh, eats that. The hexacanth larva breaks out of the intestine, gets into the bloodstream, and because it's in the intestine, usually they go to the liver. You can have multiple cysts in the liver, but if they bypass the liver, they get through the liver without being trapped. They'll pass through the right heart, and the lung is usually the second place. However, occasionally you can see these hydatid cysts somewhere else, but by numbers. They're most commonly seen in the liver, and they are secondarily most commonly seen in the lung. The idea is that the animal will die, and then the dog will come in and, and eat the liver or the lung, and the life cycle will start again. Hydatid cyst. Echinococcus granulosus. These have, you can't see through them like you can through a lot of cystodes. Cysts. They have extremely thick walls, often surrounded by fibrous connective tissue, as this one was. Here's a wall of fibrous connective tissue. We're looking at an incised lung, and uh, this will keep this particular cyst very viable, um, even long after the death of the animal. Lung worms in cattle. This is Dictyocala viviparis, most commonly seen. The adults are found in the airways. Uh, larva eggs may be found in the alveoli, most commonly seen in the caudodorsal airways. Don't cause a whole lot of problem. Um, probably if, if people think that they could be fatal, I don't know if they ever get bad enough to be fatal in cattle. Really beautiful picture by Jose Ramos Vera. Um, and this is an aspiration pneumonia. Here's an animal that was drenched with chaopectate. And someone wasn't very good at drenching them, filled the lung with, uh, with chaopectate. It was aspirated. You can see that the animal has undergone some dyspnea because A, the uh, interlobular septa are expanded by edema and emphysema, and B, we're seeing the lung. So the animal obviously died in a wonderful case of aspiration pneumonia. This is a sterile aspiration. We know because the lung is not cavitated, it is not black because of the presence of bacteria from the rumen um, coming up and getting into the lung. Okay, we have, uh, have three, uh, three images left, which is great because my voice is starting to go after almost an hour of talking. We're at 52 minutes, so let's finish this up. Um, this is not a lung. This is the rumen of a white-tailed deer, and you see these sort of pearlescent areas uh, on the rumen. And if it was from anywhere else than the north-central U.S. in the area of Michigan, I might call this a mesothelioma. But one of the reasons that we are unable to eradicate Mycobacterium bovis is that it's well ensconced in, in a number of our wildlife, including white-tailed deer, elk, and bison in the north and north-central uh, U.S. And in the northern reaches of Michigan, many of the deer are affected with Mycobacterium bovis. They're a persistent reservoir, and when you open them up, you can see in the lining of the chest or in the abdomen these sort of pearlescent nodules, which are granulomas of Mycobacterium bovis. Here is a case of uh, hydrothorax pulmonary congestion and edema. I'd have to have a, a large uh, list of rule outs for this depending on where the animal is from. Um, this is the result of left-sided heart failure. Um, it may be due to uh, infection by Neurachexia ruminantium or heart water disease could be uh, uh, quite a number of things. Uh, could be altitude sickness, usually that would be uh, right-sided cardiac heart failure, could be due to pericarditis, but just a very nice um, case of hydrothorax in an ox. And our last slide for this particular section, and thank you so much for your patience, and hanging in there is truly mesothelioma, a, uh, a fairly common neoplasm in cattle. I think of it more commonly in cattle than other species, and seen in all ages of cattle. It might even be congenital. 
and usually um, you have this sort of pearlescent uh, appearance to most often seen in the chest but you can see it anywhere it is the mesothelium so you have mesothelium lining every uh, tissue it can go down through the inguinal canal into and around the vaginal tunic so look for this you will probably find it they're often biphasic um, so you can have a part that looks like proliferating uh, epithelium and underneath that you'll have an area that uh, looks like uh, mesenchymal cells or very sarcominous and and in cattle they often have both appearances within the same tumor in the abdomen it's often associated with a lot of uh, ascites which we call malignant ascites in other species I you know, I would have to rule out adenocarcinoma and carcinomatosis. Not that common in, uh, in cattle. So mesothelioma in a case like this is going to be my first, second, and third diagnosis. And I will, I will challenge the tumor to prove me wrong when I get it under the microscope. Okay. Well, that ends our section on the respiratory system. And it looks like we have one final uh, lecture in the series, lucky lecture number 13, where we will cover the urinary system. So I hope that you hang around for that, and we will see you next time. Have a great day.